big benefit in terms of reducing the finishing age of animals. The big benefit that has is it helps to reduce the amount of methane and other greenhouse gases associated with the production of animals over the whole entire life cycle of the animals. And as I said, it's not necessarily that, what we said, the target is there to have the average population at a finishing age of 22 to 23 months of age. That doesn't mean that every single animal needs to be finished at 22 to 23 months of age. That's the average for the overall population, which will include different dynamics in terms of genders of animals, as well as separate, I suppose, targets for, for individual categories and genders and, and, and breeds of animals as well. So it's not that every single animal would have to be reduced to finish at 22 to 23 months of age. That's what we're looking for, for the average of the total prime beef cat population. Hello and welcome to The Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and with a target of 25% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, on this week's episode I'm joined by Chagas researcher Paul Smith to discuss the main messages related to reducing age of slaughter from the Beef 2024 Open Day and future research surrounding grass-based beef research. Paul, you're very welcome. You were responsible for the greenhouse gas village at the Open Day, which created huge interest among farmers. What are the key take-home messages from the village? Yeah, well, thanks very much for having me, Catherine. So at the Beef Open Day, we had a grass, we had a greenhouse gas village there, which basically, I suppose, first of all, what we had is we had a demonstration showing people how we were measuring the green, how we were measuring methane emissions from from beef cattle, particularly at grass. And I suppose the big thing that we were using is, is is the green feed system. And we were showing people how animals use that and subsequently how we use that then to go and predict and measure how much methane animals are, are producing. Another thing that generated a lot of interest at the open day was the, the research that's been conducted today in Chagas Grange on on feed additives. So we had a variety of different feed additives and the results from different trials looking at, say, oils, looking at bovia or tree nut. Um, looking at some more novel compounds such as rumen glass or, or rumen oxidizing compounds um, as well as I suppose maybe looking as well at the role of maybe different forages and the impact that they have on methane emissions. So huge interest in how we measure methane as well as then the impact that the additives are having on it as well. And from the additive point of view, how effective are some of the feed additives that you mentioned there at reducing methane emissions? So looking at some of the, the, the results from the results from the trials here in Grange, so some of the additives have been shown in some of our indoor studies to reduce methane by up to by up to thirty percent. And one of the most effective ones that we've tested to date, or two of the most effective ones, were the the, the tree NOP or Bovier, um, as well as as a compound called rumen glass. I suppose the yeah, as I said, both of them coming in and around thirty percent in terms of their reduction potential there for methane emissions. Some other kind of favorable results coming through on the oils. Um linseed oil again being shown to reduce methane by about eighteen to twenty percent, and then rapeseed oil and the byproduct actually from, from rapeseed oil production, the rapeseed cake, both of them have been shown to reduce methane emissions by, by about seven to eight percent in some of our indoor studies. So um a lot of positive research there on on the role or the potential impact that feed additives can have within an indoor setting when it comes to it comes to reducing methane emissions. And how far away do you think we are from actually implementing some of those on commercial farms? Yeah, so it's a very good question, Catherine. So I suppose it very much depends on the type of additive that that we're looking at. Um, so I suppose maybe we look at some of the synthetic additives, that's your, your tree nup and your and your rumen gloss compound, I suppose, for any of them to be used within the beef sector, um, they're going to have to receive regulatory approval. And I suppose one of the trials that we carried out in Grange the, that was um, and on, on, on the Bovier, that was going towards, I suppose, Ireland's or the European Union Food Safety Authorities application for for, 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 for tree nup. Um, so I suppose firstly, they're going to need to be approved to make sure that they're having no um, those latent effects on, on the animal or on the meat that they're doing and subsequently on, 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 on from a human health point of view. So that's the first thing from the synthetics. They need to get European approval first before we can start using them. Um, and then the other thing with the oils and the uh, the oils, I suppose, potentially oils could, in the morning, in theory, be put into feed additives. Um, one of the big issues that we have with the oils, though, I suppose, is the potential costs that is associated with, with, with some of the oils. So that could potentially be an inhibitor um, inhibit there, I suppose, their use. But I suppose while the, the additives are looking quite favourable at the moment in terms of some of the indoor studies, one of the big challenges is trying to get either the additives or the active compounds that's in those additives and trying to get them to animals when they're out of grass. So that, that that's going to be a real big challenge going forward. Um, and I suppose it's going to have to be a key, 
key kind of priority for for both industry and for research trying to develop ways to to try and format or package these key compounds into such a form that can be that can be available and and utilized within the, within the grass basis most definitely paul and reducing the finishing age of beef cattle was a key focus at the beef 2024 open day can you explain why this a benefit in reducing greenhouse gas emissions yeah, Catherine. So again, yeah, reducing the finishing age of beef cattle. That's that's one of the main, I suppose, greenhouse gas mitigation strategies for 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 the beef sector. So, at the moment, we have a a target there that's been set to basically reduce the finishing age of the overall prime beef cattle population to to twenty two to twenty three months of age by twenty thirty. So, and um, that's going from say in twenty eighteen when this legislation or when this target was kind of set, the average finishing age of the population of cattle was was at twenty six, and we're looking to reduce that by three to four months, um, by 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 twenty thirty. So the big benefit in terms of reducing the finishing age of animals, the big benefit that has is it helps to reduce the amount of methane. Um, and other greenhouse gases associated with the production of animals over the whole entire life cycle of 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 the animals. Um, and as I said, it's not necessarily that what we said the target is there to have the average population at a finishing age of 22 to 23 months of age. That doesn't mean that every single animal needs to be finished at 22, 22 to 23 months of age. That's the average for the overall population, which will include different dynamics in terms of genders of animals, as well as separate, I suppose, targets for, for individual categories and genders and, and, and breeds of animals as well. So it's not that every single animal would have to be reduced to finish at 22 to 23 months of age. That's what we're looking for, for the average of the total prime beef cattle population. And as you say, there's huge variation there. What are the key take-up messages from the finishing demo? And can you outline the finishing demo just for listeners? Yeah, so at the at, at Beef 2024, we had a finishing demo, which basically was allowing, which was, I suppose, um, the main take-home message from the, the finishing demo and the reason why we decided to do that was that about 30% of of our prime beef cattle can kind of be considered, I suppose we call them over fat at, at, at finish. So what the main thing of what we're doing is if those animals could maybe be slaughtered at a more optimal fat cover back to around your, your three plus or lower, we'd be saying that that's an avenue that potentially that animals could could be looking to, to reduce the finishing age of those animals. So a big focus on the finishing demo was, I suppose, demonstrating what different animals look like um, across the different fat classes, as well as having industry representatives there from some of the, the, the different beef processors showing and I suppose giving farmers different tips on ways in which they can select and draft their animals um, which are appropriately fleshed uh, for, 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 for slaughter. And you mentioned that the average age of slaughter in 2018 was 26 months. What progress has been made to date in terms of reducing the finishing age? Yeah, so I suppose, Catherine, over the last decade and a half, um, finishing age since since 2010, I suppose, has dropped by about two months. We have saw significant progress in, in particularly in our steer. So the average steer finishing age has dropped by about a week per annum, um, which is which is significant progress there at the moment. Heifers a little bit less and subsequently the young bulls as well. It's potentially maybe one or two days for, for each of them. But particularly with the steers, we're seeing significant progress there. As I said, uh, over the last decade and a half, about an annual reduction of about uh, a week uh per year in, 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 in their finishing age. And one of the key things is that while yes, we have reduced the finishing age, um, as I said, of the total population by about twenty by about two months. Overall, when we look at the carcass weights, the average carcass weight being produced by different categories of steers, heifers and young bulls, there hasn't been major um, negative impacts on, on the average carcass weight that's being produced. So the main take home message being that, yes, we have reduced finishing age um, by about two months without having a major negative impact on, on carcass weight. And that's really a significant achievement, Paul, overall. Looking at the research going forward, what research is focused on reducing age at slaughter? Yeah, Catherine. So we're after getting, um, I suppose, we recently got funding from the Department of Agriculture as part of the last round of the research stimulus funding. We've got a project funded called BeefQuest, which is going to run for four years. It's a collaboration between ourselves and Chagas. ICBF and and UCD and basically what this project is looking to do is trying to look at on commercial farms what the main factors out there are that are I suppose limiting or having a negative impact on the live weight gain of of, of different classes of animals so we're particularly looking at at nutrition genetics animal health as well as on farm environment to see what over those factors is having a major impact on, on the growth rates of animals. So why are some animals being finished at 24 months, but why are some animals that again are born at a similar time and um, subsequently going on to be finished at, at, at 28 months? 
of age. And I suppose as part of this project, one of the key things that we're looking to do is to go out to commercial farms. So we're looking to recruit about 200 commercial farms to the to the project, whereby we will be visiting the farms, collecting weight data, as well as data associated with feed analysis, uh, animal health records, and as well as on farm environment. And basically allowing that to, to, to come into our into our study and we subsequently will be carrying a variety of different modeling exercises to look at the impacts of some of these factors on the bioeconomics as well as the greenhouse gas emissions of 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 the different systems and the different farms. So what I would say is if there's any potential farms out there that would be interested in getting involved in this program um, or in this project, I'd ask for them to, to, to contact me directly. Um, uh, we'd be very much uh, interested in having you on board. And I suppose from the farmer's point of view, what will what we'd be offering to them is we'd be offering them a free weighing service um, across a variety of times throughout the, throughout the lifetime of, of growing uh, growing animals, as well as a free silage analysis as well to the farmers. And as well, there'll also be reports kind of given back to the farmers, showing them where their their progress is compared to the rest of the, the farmers within the pro, within the program and some of our some of our national data. So again, as I said, the free weighing service is one of the key things. So as as I'm sure the listeners all know, the most accurate way we can judge the performance of beef cattle is by regularly weighing these animals. So as I said, if farmers want to avail of a free weighing service as part of this project, um, I would encourage them to get in touch with us and we can see if they can be involved in, in, in the project. Uh, my details can be found on the Chagas website um, and my email is paul.smith, smith with an I, at Chagas. That's great, Paul. I'll include your details in the podcast text. It sounds like a very interesting study. We look forward to hear the outcomes in the coming years from this research. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Catherine. That's all for this week's episode. And my thanks to Paul for joining me on the show. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.